everyone. Welcome to your Sunday edition of Collider Mailbag. I'm Perry. I'm still here. Riley's still here. We're still standing. We're oh. not walking. We're oh. not walking. We're not walking. No, no. we're going to stand. We're going to talk about Mailbag. Your questions. And we're going to stand right here and do it. Yeah. That's right. I'm pretty pumped for this right now. We've yeah. got a monitor. we got a studio. we got a camera. we got an audience. we got a Cody. we got a Cody. <laughs> we got everything. But the question is, do we have question number one? Ooh. That we do. And this question comes from Ruben, who writes, Hey guys, my question is in regards to book to movie adaptations. Would you say it's better to read a novel before you see the adaptation, or should it be the other way around? There's been two instances where I took my sweet time reading a book before the adaptation, Molly's Game and the Disaster Artist. In doing so, I waited until the last minute to catch a screening. Oh, the endless debate. The chicken yeah. or the egg. This is such, a, like, it, it happens all the time when these big movies are coming out, especially Jurassic Park, our favorite. Mm -hmm. Jaws, huh? There's your reference. Do you read the book first or do you wait for the movie? That is entirely up to you because what I always do is like, how big of the movie is it that I want to be surprised in the theater? Because no matter what, if you read the book, no matter how different it is from The Shining to the Kubrick movie or Benchley's Jaws compared to Jaws, the movie, there are things that happen in the books that could spoil the movie going experience. So it, it really depends. I read Jurassic Park before the movie and I loved the movie as much as I loved the book. I read Jaws after I saw the movie and the book was so different, but it added different layers to it, like an a, like a alternate universe of Jaws characters. Those who've read Jaws book, you know what I'm talking about. So I guess it's like your preference. Yeah, I, that's really the only way I can answer this question is from personal preference and my experience having read a lot of books that are adapted to film. Oftentimes at the beginning of this, because basically when I first started doing this job, I got very obsessed with the art of adaptation because it fascinated me because there's so there's drastically different adaptations from more straightforward adaptations to an experience I had recently with The Shining the Movie versus The Shining the Book. And I think ultimately one of my favorite, I guess, end results of a book to film adaptation is when you're in a position where you could read the book first, you could see the movie first, it doesn't matter, one will always enhance the other. And that's mm -hmm. something that I've said about the movie Room. I think that's Ooh. definitely the case with that. It doesn't matter which comes first. And I will say that it's a very similar thing with The Shining, even though that I've admitted reading The Shining book has made me wish certain elements from that book were in the feature film, but they're two different experiences. So I like when you could read or watch one in either order and it doesn't matter because it just, both of them wind up enhancing whatever that world and that story is. But I've also been in positions where particularly with more straightforward adaptations where I've seen the movie and I know that there's a big fan base behind the book series, yeah. particularly with Harry Potter mm -hmm. and Twilight, saw those movies before I touched a book and I picked up the book, read a couple chapters, and I put it down for both of them. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I think of Suzanne Collins' Hunger Games. Yeah. That had a rabid fan base. They were making videos of Katniss before Jennifer Lawrence was cast, and then there was a kind of a a screaming and yelling into the void when Jennifer Lawrence was cast, they didn't see Katniss. So it really depends. Yeah, you bring up a good point. There are book series that are diehard fandoms, Harry Potter, Hunger Games, you know, I, I would say Crichton's collection because I mm -hmm. love Crichton, but it, it really, yeah, it, it, it really depends. If there's a big budget, like if I knew Ready Player One was coming before I read the book, I might wait for the movie because it's Spielberg coming back to like a nostalgia centric 80s reference kind of Spielberg back into what yeah. Spielberg is doing and that excites me as a I'm a movie lover and a book lover so I might have waited for Ready Player One the movie and then picked up the book but I've read the book because I'm a book lover as well and everybody was saying hey Ready Player One is really good you should check it out Riley so I did mm -hmm. so again I think it's up to you guys. Yeah, up, up to you, and it depends what style of adaptation they're going with, too. Yeah. All right, next question. Next what is question. it? Well, hey, Collider crew. It's from Harry Green. Harry Sorry, I'm Green. doing this different. All right, Harry Green says, let me just say that I was totally impressed with Black Panther because it touched on so many issues in society while at the same time staying true to the comic world. It is one of those great films where art imitates life. 
and I would like to say more, but I just don't know how many characters this email can allow. Hey, do you think Iron Man's suit will receive a vibranium upgrade to help him fight against Thanos in Infinity War? Um, yeah. I don't necessarily know if it's going to happen in Infinity War, but I think Vibranium will be incorporated into almost everything the Avengers use in order to take down Thanos. If Thanos is supposed to be the biggest bad in the MCU we've ever seen, where they all yeah. have to unite in order to take him down, yeah. it would make sense that what they've been fighting with so far isn't good enough, and why not tap into this alien material that happens to be the strongest thing in the entire world? You're going to want to incorporate that into Iron Man's suit and just about everything else. And I've come down to two possible conclusions with what we've seen in the Infinity War trailer, and it's that because we see that big war in Wakanda, mm. they're either protecting the vibranium and or they could be protecting an Infinity Stone. So that's where I was going. One with or the that. other. Yeah, I think, well, I think Shuri's already got some kind of mock up going for Iron Man. I mean, <laughs> that kid. She stole the She's movie. She's the best. She, so, you know, when we had a mailbag question to, can you see, like, Shuri becoming the next Iron Man if we follow the comic line where a woman stepped into the suit? But, yeah, everything you said. Look, you have the most precious metal in the world, in the galaxy, maybe, in Wakanda. Might not, you might as well use it to take on Thanos, and I think you're absolutely right. I think we're going to get there. It's going to be some kind of battle. Are they after an Infinity Stone? Are they after the, the metal itself? I would love to see Shuri really step up and put Tony Stark in his place when he's like, well, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, oh, yeah. And there's like maybe a new suit, a new weapon that I can see almost like when, he, when Tony Stark meets Hulk mm -hmm. on the helicarrier and their minds just do this thing where they, yeah. they're simpatico with each other. Can you imagine Shuri and Tony Stark trading barbs and technology and like, and him getting sucked into her world going, wait a minute, you have this? That's a scene that's probably gonna happen. So I, I think it's a foregone inclusion that yes, we probably will get vibranium, but maybe not in this Infinity War. We'll see possibly. maybe what's gonna happen after because you know this could be a dark ending to get us into the next one and maybe Tony Stark's gonna need a little help. Yeah, I think you might be right on that. And even more so than just seeing the Avengers fight with cool new vibranium equipped gear, I'm more excited, I think, for bringing Shuri into the Avengers in a way that could force her to have that kind of fun chemistry that we saw a little bit in Black Panther with other characters that we're so familiar with, yeah. like a Bucky, like a, uh, an Iron Man, and really, the possibilities are endless with they that. Really are. I, I mean, I've said it before, I'll say it again. She's my favorite new addition to the MCU, and I just want to see her just have fun and chemistry and bring life to every movie and every relationship. She might be mine, too. I just adore her and, yeah. and, uh, and Michael B. Jordan's Killmonger. I hope, uh, yeah, well, that's a mailbag for another time. <laughs> All right, next question. Number three comes from Ooh. Edgar, who writes, Hello, Collider. I was really excited about two films this year, one being A Quiet Place and the second being Annihilation. Mm. Unfortunately, I literally just found out that Annihilation was sold to Netflix and will not have a UK theatrical release. Alex Garland said, Disappointment, really. He said when asked on his feelings about it all, we made the film for cinema. I've got no problem with the small screen at all. The best genre piece I've seen in a long time, The Handmaid's Tale. So I think there's incredible potential within that context. But if you're doing that, you make it for that format and you think of it in those terms. But from my point of view and the collective of the people who made it, it was made to be seen on a big screen. For something that looks so interesting to experience at the movie theater like Annihilation, it's difficult for me to reconcile the decision. Is this the kind of thing Jodie Foster may have been trying to articulate but failed to correctly weave the nuanced wording that her perspective required? Maybe people, myself included, got stuck on the example she used as a generality rather than focusing on the specific principle behind her point of view. Ooh, good question. Have fun I, with that. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know if Jodie Foster was making a comment on superhero movies mm -hmm. more so that it was like kind of I don't know her wording was interesting I don't think it has anything to do with this question I think that the, the real question if I'm looking into it correctly is it's a bummer you're not gonna see annihilation in a theater that's what I'm taking from mm -hmm. it I don't know if you read something else because if you look at the the marketing materials all the trailers for annihilation you want to see this on the big screen mm -hmm. you got creatures you got weird effects you have 
you know, it, 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 it looks beautiful. You, you want to get those sound effects. I mean, you, you hear the soundtrack in that, in that trailer. You want it pumped in everything. You want that theater experience. So I don't think Jody, Jodie Foster was talking about this. I think what she was talking about is the superhero genre. This is a whole new thing. This Netflix thing, this is a sign of the future. We're going to start getting these movies directly to your home because there are people out there that want it. Even though they might not be film lovers like us, they don't want to go spend $20 on parking and food and another $50 on two tickets. They want to stay, they pay for their Netflix subscription. They don't have to move, they can turn it on at home. I think that's very enticing for people with kids. Uh, you know, th my mother that doesn't necessarily want to get out and go to the movies, I think that that's the future we're looking at right mm -hmm. now. And it's a bummer. I'm hoping we get to see Annihilation in theaters, but Netflix isn't offering that in the UK. That's a bummer. Yeah, I think it's only getting distributed theatrically in like three territories, including the US. But, Damn. you know, I'll just reiterate something you said because having seen Annihilation, I think it's true. Technically, it is a movie that I think is best experienced in the theater. The visuals are stunning, and I would want to see that on the big screen. The sound design is also something else. So yeah. I, I wish that everybody could have the option to experience that if they want to. But, you know, looking at it from a business perspective, it makes sense because Annihilation, I think the reason all this came up is because, or at least based on, you know, articles I've read over the past year, when the test screenings happened, the movie didn't test very well. And mm. I think that had Paramount execs kind of shaking in their boots because, you know, we all, you know, us here and uh, people who want to see Annihilation on the big screen, they go into it wanting to have that kind of experience. But bad test screenings might mean that it is less likely to make a lot of money. And distributing any movie costs a lot of money. Oh, so yeah. if you could take away that cost because of the big risk, I understand why this would be their thought process, but I actually do think that they're both talking. Um, Garland and Jodie Foster are talking about the same thing, but they're coming at it from two different perspectives. Yeah. He's talking about it from the angle of Paramount Paramount hired me to make this movie for a theatrical release. I did that, and Paramount saw what I had, and apparently Scott Rudin produced it, and he had a final cut on the movie. Oh, that's right. What we were going to make, what we were commissioned to make, they saw what we made, then they started shaking in their boots, so they're like, eh, let's not deal with the international uh, theatrical release. Let's just make sure we make some money in the U.S. and then cheap out and dump the rest on Netflix. That scares me, and I think that makes his points pretty valid here. So you have that which runs the risk of hurting any movie that's made in that, you know, the $40 million budget range. And then right. you have Jodie Foster coming at something similar from another perspective, which is you have studios throwing insane amount of money, amounts of money into superhero films, Star Wars films, all these big, big properties. And I'm not saying this is true of all of these companies and all of these franchises, but a lot of times we do see money being pumped into movies like that. And sometimes they're not very good. And right. things are done to make sure that they can make a lot of money, not caring about quality. Mm -hmm. And I think both, both business models runs the risk of taking away unique kinds of movies in that middle budget range. So yeah. I think they're both coming at the same thing from different perspectives, and I think there's really no avoiding either thing right now. This is just the path that this industry is heading down. Yeah. And, you know, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that the end point is that only big budget movies, only big superhero movies and blockbusters are going to be released in theaters, but it's certainly a possibility. So. I mean, every single time I hear a story like this, I'm constantly analyzing every little thing because I'm so curious to see how all this pans out. Well, one constant that I'm noticing from this is Paramount. They did it with Cloverfield I know, Paradox. I know. They dumped it because they were afraid of it, and rightly so. The, the movie didn't live up to, to the other two, in my opinion. I didn't think it was that great. Paramount unloaded that on Netflix to save some money. It looks mm -hmm. like they did the same. So Paramount is really... They're really fidgety lately. Yeah. We've and had the conversations about Transformers. Should they reboot? They don't have a real franchise other than Mission Impossible that they can hang their hat on. This could have been maybe another franchise. Yeah. I don't know. They have the book series that's based on. 
We'll see how it does, Annihilation in theaters. I can't blame them for wanting to do this with both Annihilation and Cloverfield Paradox, yeah. but one of the scariest things I've read on this specific topic uh -oh. were those quotes from the Paramount Studios CEO, where yeah. he, he said something along the lines of, like, we're, we're assessing what's with vi I forget the words he use, uses off the top of my head, yeah, but, I know what you're... but we made this decision by assessing what we think is viable nowadays, you know, yeah. in terms of uh, theatrical financial success. and. The, the fact uh. that, I don't know, maybe maybe this isn't fair for me to do, but reading that quote makes me picture a rich suit sitting in a seat and saying, oh, like, worthy of the theater, not worthy of the theater. And that doesn't feel fair, and that also takes a lot of the risk and creative freedom out of the industry, and that's a very scary thing to me. It is a scary thing, and it's something that has, you know, plagued Hollywood for years, is you have these men, these suits in the ivory tower, and they aren't connected to the, the, the ongoing audience that like we are, where you want to be in the theater, where it's something like, I mean, the rumor is, is that Warner Brothers looked at Wonder Woman and went, it's not going to be good. <laughs> and look what happened. And vice versa on that, standing ovation for a screening of Batman v Superman, and you saw what happened there. Mm. So look, there are, there are a lot of examples of, of these Suits not really getting it. I hope Paramount really starts to take some chances in the future with their franchises and put them out in theaters. We need all different kind of things. That's just a movie lover. I want to be able to look at the marquee and have a lot of options, not just Star Wars and Marvel and DC, but like a lot of things. So yep. I'm right there with you. All right, we'll see. On to the next question then. Here we go. We got it from Laura who writes, Hi, Collider crew. Given the Academy's penchant for trying to look socially aware, do you think Black Panther has a shot to overcome the Academy's hmm. hatred of comic book films and get some nominations next year? If so, which categories do you think it would have a shot at? Thanks, looking at, thanks for looking at my question and for making my drives home entertaining every day. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. I, lo I love this question. Yeah. And it jumps off of a little something that I was talking about with Dennis on yesterday's mailbag. And okay. it was about uh, Black Panther's box office being so much bigger than Wonder Woman's. And mm. I suggested that Black Panther was still riding the Wonder Woman wave where that was a hot topic. So Black Panther just used it as a springboard and made a crazy amount of money because of it. Both right. of them are huge financial successes. But Black Panther clearly is on a level that I don't think many people expected it to reach. So so I think the same thing might happen or has a possi possible chance of happening courtesy of the constant hype of Wonder Woman from its release straight through to award season. And I know it didn't get any nominations, but right. guilds and organizations were still talking about it. It's on top 10 lists, all that good stuff. I mean, but Producers I, Guild gave Wonder Woman exactly. a nod, so that's, that, that was huge mm -hmm. in itself. So I think it's going to use that as a springboard in addition to Logan and even, you could say, Deadpool when we were all talking about that movie's potential Academy Award nomination the year before. Right. So I think that this could all build a nice momentum to give Black Panther a chance, but... Let's be real here. We're talking about a superhero movie being released in February. I am confident that, especially in the next few weeks, with no major, major blockbuster stealing any of Black Panther's spotlight for a little while, that this thing is going to have legs for weeks oh, and make yeah. a ton of money. And, you know, we're talking right now about Get Out getting a lot of nominations. That was a February release. That's true. I think that the momentum could possibly continue to see a similar response to Wonder Woman where maybe it's not getting actual Academy Award nominations, even though I would put my money on uh, Ruthie Carter. I yes. think that if anything, we could see Black Panther get a costume uh, Academy Award nomination, but I think we could be in a position where come the end of the year, you're seeing this movie get a lot of recognition for its achievements as a standalone movie, a great piece of film in and of itself, but also in terms of making waves in the industry and actually inciting change. Yeah, I think a, a couple of things stand out to me. The writing stood out. I mean, it really did. Kugler, and, and I'm forgetting uh, his co-writer's name, I apologize for that, because you were well worth the mention. That stood out for me. The music stood out for me. Ruthie Carter's costume design. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of get the usual kind of suspects, effects, yeah. maybe sound editing, sound mixing. You know, these are the things that the big budget blockbusters get the noms for. But there is a change in the works here. And I do think that Black Panther could be nominated. If the hype continues, if people continue to see this, if this breaks a mm -hmm. billion, which it's already on track to do, I think it will do. Um, I think the conversation could change, and I think the Academy could 
acknowledge it because what Wonder Woman started, and I agree with you, I think Wonder Woman really started that conversation where it's like, you've never given women and women filmmakers or a female-led blockbuster a chance. You, you brush it aside. The same could be argued about Black Panther, though people do say Blade, and earlier works where a, a black man was leading the movie. Mm -hmm. Black Panther is different in that it's, it's, a, it's a universal, there are so many people working on this movie. I mean, you have Coogler, the writer, then Ruthie Carter. There's something in this movie that I think we might see a nomination. That's just my feeling. I wouldn't mind if it came to that. I think they could if, remember this conversation. <laughs> I think at the end of the year, you could see a re-release of Black Panther to capitalize mm -hmm. on this and get an Oscar push. I think if any, any of these movies deserve it, it might be Black Panther. I would agree with that happening. I would put my money right now on Carter getting the nomination above all else, but I wouldn't be so surprised if towards the end of the year, and you know, it's also dependent on what other movies come out between now and the end of 2018, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of the things we're considering and talking about could be potential Best Director and Best Picture nominations. But yeah. Obviously, very early predictions happening here because it's the beginning of the year still. It's the beginning of the year. I'll throw one more. Michael Ooh. B. Jordan, Best Supporting Actor. See, he that... He was good. That's the one that I would be hard-pressed to it's, predict. It's hard, be, yeah. Because it's got such a, a large amount of really great, memorable supporting performances. And while that makes it... You know, maybe Ensemble, actually, at, at the SAG, SAG Awards, Awards for that sure. seems like it's in the realm of possibility. But when yeah. it comes to isolating one supporting performance, it's... You know, we talk about it with three billboards. Are Woody Harrelson... Is Woody Harrelson going to take some of uh, Sam Rockwell's votes away? It's just... True. We have so many great supporting performances in this movie that I want want to recognize that I feel like that could dilute the the, the possibilities, mm. if that makes any sense. Hashtag Shuri for a nomination. All right. That. All right. We got one more question. Let's get to it. It comes from Dan. Mm. It's been a while since the events of the first Halloween movie. So <gasps> what's Michael Myers been up to since then? Has he just been hanging out? So I picked this question for a reason. And so this guy here could tell you guys what he told me the other day. I love this question because it occurred to me, what has, okay, so we get the, re, not the reboot, we get this direct sequel to Carpenter's original. At first, it was the sequel to Halloween and Halloween 2, then Carpenter came out or somebody came out, clarified, they're getting rid of all the Halloween movies. It picks up 40 years later after the events of the original movie. So Michael is shot by Loomis, mm -hmm. falls off the balcony, Everybody, is that the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was. They look over, he's gone. Now, 40 years later, what has Michael been doing? That really got to me. I'm like, what, what could he possibly do? I go to the script. Carpenter wrote an amazing script where Michael Myers was mentioned by name by Dr. Loomis, but in the script, he's the shape. He's a force of nature. He's scary. He is the boogeyman. He appears wherever, and you got to watch out for yourself. He's going to come and just out of nowhere kill you. What does that do to somebody? And it occurred to me, I was wondering, does he like blend into society? Does he hide out? Does he become not an upstanding member of society, but somebody that you can put the serial killer moniker on, which is, he's so quiet, I didn't expect that. Does Michael Myers get an apartment somewhere and he's just that quiet guy that everybody just waves at him and he just nods and walks off? I don't necessarily like that because it goes against the description in the script yeah. where he's a force of nature. So by that definition, you don't want to know what he's done for 40 years. But there has to be some kind of nod to it in the storytelling. I guess the force of nature thing could be a switch that you flip on and off, though. For, That's a good for point. For all I know, I could just picture him walking through the streets, like, off to work for the day. And then in his free time, maybe he's... Killing. Doing terrible things. Um, that, well, seems, I mean, that seems less likely to me. If, if I was envisioning what he wound up doing, because he's a force of nature and he is basically the boogeyman, but he's still a human being that needs resources being. to survive. So I think my mind leans towards, oh, he just is hunting 
animals in the woods and living in a cabin and see yes that's but it's that's a very obvious thing and I which think, is why I don't think it's going to happen uh, that's right because I think Gordon Green and Danny McBride came up with this idea and pitched it to Carpenter who went yeah, yeah and gave his seal of approval not only seal of approval came on his composer and EP and it's Blumhouse so we you know Blumhouse knows what they're doing with these horror movies yeah does he disappear does he I don't know. does he become the quiet guy in the corner I mean Rob Zombie kind of explored the <laughs> idea of a homeless Michael that's just kind of wandering around after the events of the first one. Get that out of there. Uh, I don't want to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting to think. I could also see him just, I mean, do we need to know that as audience members, as lovers of Halloween? You know, do we need to know that? I mean, part of me, if you're going to pick up 40 years later and ignore all the other Halloweens, yeah, I want to yeah, know a no, little bit. No, you need some sort of motivation. Yeah. And I, I'm starting to think that this jumping off point might even be more important than, you know, what's Lori been up to and where, where are we going to find her when we reunite with her? I think because this Michael Myers' return will essentially be the inciting incident of the whole movie. And right. if that doesn't come back to with a good reason, then what are we all doing here? So yeah. that seems to me almost like the more important thing to address. And I think you need, you don't need to explain it to death and have exposition coming out your ears like crazy while you're watching this movie, but you do need a very concrete, catchy, interesting reason for him to be back. Well, there's a lot of stories you could look at of true crime. The BTK, the BTK yeah. killer comes to mind. It was a killer, bind, torture, kill. He was in Kansas. He disappeared for like 20 years and then he came back. And so that, that was an interesting true story where, but this was a guy that really wanted the attention. He liked to goad the cops. He mm -hmm. would write them notes. Why aren't you covering me? And then he'd go kill somebody. So I don't see Michael Myers like that. No. Maybe it is flipping a switch where he just kind of hides out, lays low. The other one I was thinking of that he never left. He's always in yeah. the shadows looking at Lori and maybe just biding his time until the events of this next movie. That sounds eerier to me. Yeah, that actually sounded scary. <laughs> oh, sure. Can well, I, I mean, I can't wait to see what <clears throat> they actually deliver. And yeah. my, my hopes are pretty high right now. I'm feeling pretty good about the team behind that movie and Blumhouse being team. involved. So. We shall see. Do you guys have better ideas than what we just came up with, though? Because if you do, make sure to put them in the comments section below, because we really want to read them. Thank you so much to everybody who sent in questions today. If you want your question addressed on next week's mailbag, mailbag episodes, send it on over, collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll read them. Maybe we'll pick them and discuss them. I look forward to reading them. Riley, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you to everybody watching right now. Please like and share this video. We'll see you soon with more movie news. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.